The day starts before the crack of dawn Feed the baby, then get breakfast on No quiet time for me This day is crazy Wake the kids and our till school begins Check the sheets, he's wet the bed again Extra load of laundry Shouldn't mean a thing to me Go find your shoes, go brush your hair hey. The dog threw up and it's everywhere Her diaper's full, it's time to go Stop fighting or I'll lose control I may get down, but I'll get up hey. Get ready cause I've had Shout to God, all creation. 
those who gave birth this year to their first child, we celebrate with you. To those who have lost a child, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who experience loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions, or running away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes, prods, tears, and disappointment, we walk with you. To those single moms who shoulder the responsibility alone, we honor you. To those who are foster moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms, we need you. To those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate you. To those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with your children, we sit with you. To those who have lost their mothers, we grieve with you. To those who experienced abuse at the hands of your own mother, we acknowledge your experience. To those who lived through driving tests, medical tests, and the overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. To those who have aborted children, we remember them and you on this day. To those who are single and long to be married and mothering your own children, we mourn with you that life has not turned out the way that you long for it to be. To those who step-parent, 
we walk with you on these complex paths. To those who envision lavishing love on grandchildren, yet the dream is not to be, we grieve with you. To those who will have emptier nests in the upcoming year, we grieve and rejoice with you. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate with you. This Mother's Day, we walk with you. Mothering is not for the faint of heart, and we have real warriors in our midst. We remember you. 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 Happy Mother's Day. Um, if I failed to say it, I, I want to say it now. And um, I just, uh, Mother's Day evokes a lot of emotions for different people. And, and I showed that video clip. I took that from another church. Um, but those are all the things I wish we could say as a church um, about mothers. Um, it's a difficult day for some people here today. I understand that um, for many reasons. Some have lost moms. Um, there are moms that have lost children. There are moms who haven't been moms yet and desire to be. Um, there are moms, or there are people here that have had bad moms and uh, have gone through abuse, and I understand that. And uh, we want to walk with you. That's, that's the message we want to give to people. You know what I love about this church? There are churches that, uh, every church has its own culture and identity, and there are churches that their, their identity is big bands, smoke and mirrors, fancy productions, flashy preachers, um, super auditoriums that you can do huge things in, concerts, whatever. But what I love about Maple, and I truly mean this with everything I've got to say about you guys, if I were going to, somebody asked me what I'd tell them, what I love about this church is the fact that the people here love people more than they love anything, and they love God. Love people, love God. And that's the mission of what we're trying to get across. Love people, love God. And so I appreciate that. And mothers, I know we have been in a weird year in, I don't know, a quarter so far since COVID hit. Um, we want to appreciate you as much as we can, and we are so thankful. I look on this day for two things. I'm sad, and yet I'm glad. Um, first of all, I lost my mom 11 years ago. Um, and I'll talk about her in a minute because it's going to get me emotional. But I really, it, it, I am so uh, enamored and enthralled. I was thinking about this the other day um, with the mother of my children. Um, and I know she's here and it's embarrassing for her and all that, but um, I couldn't have asked for a greater wife um, and a better mother because um, I wasn't a great father. But my wife has always been a great mom and I appreciate her. And I don't know if we say that. I, mean, I We joking kid, but um, my, mom, my wife is, is a great mom. And um, I, I love the fact that she loves people, too. And, and she had a great mom. Her mom was a great influence on her, and I thank God for that. Um, and, <clears throat> and this whole thing, we're in a series called Heroes from Zeros, and, and I'm not just up here rambling. There's a point to what I've got to say. Um, Tracy started it off last week. And, and by the way, in case you thought he was filling in, he wasn't. That was his week scheduled. Uh, the week before he filled in for me in my back, and if you're asking, like, how's your back? It's better. I'm much better. I'm not yet right, but it's better. Um, so you, I covet your prayers on that, but uh, we're doing well. Um, I'm getting a little ring up here or something. Um, but when you get down to uh, Mother's Day and moms, um, I was thinking this one question. We all have moms. You wouldn't be here if you didn't. So what makes a great mom? And if I asked that question today, um, everybody would have five to ten answers at least, and we could talk about it, probably get into heated arguments and fights over it, because that's what Baptists do. Um, we would be, you know, no this, no that. Um, and then I thought about things, and, and to me, my mom was a great mom. Um, and, and it's still, I, I appreciate the fact that she was a great mom. But really, the source of truth, we would be arguing for eternity plus if we sat here and discussed the subject, what makes a great mom today? Because it would just be our opinions. And our opinions are all relative. They are. Without some kind of absolute fact to base them on. And that's where it's great. Because we're in this series about heroes from zeros. And Jesus dealt with this issue. 
what makes a great mom. And I'm not going to tell you today what I think a great mom is. I'm not going to ask you what you think is. I'm actually going to see what Jesus had to say about it in a character story about a mom. Now, when you go to the Bible and you talk about great moms, everybody probably right away, like Mary, the, the Catholics, they revere Mary as, as queen of the universe, all those kind of things. And Mary definitely was a great mom. You've got other great mothers. Um, we can go through uh, Sarah in the Old Testament, and you've got Ruth and Esther and all these different strong leaders who were mothers, and, and they were just so great. But I find when Jesus comes and walks, the great stories that we've been talking about really are these sort of unknown stories or less known stories that we find. So if you have your Bibles today, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 15, looking at a story that is sort of like shocking. But when we get to the series, what we're outlining here and talking about the series is how does a story like this, how does it relate to me or is it just a story that we're telling? I'm not just up here telling you a story because it's cool to tell stories. There's a point to this. Because I think, especially in our day and age time, I don't think there's more of a time when people, in general, are marginalized more. If you believe something that's not popular, you're out. If you take a stand for something that might be conservative, you're out. You've got to go with what the popular opinion says, you've got to go with what the world says. And I think even today, and I think it's always been that hard, I think the toughest job on the planet that anyone could ever do is the job of being a mom. My mom, talking about her once again, my mom got up every morning of my life somewhere between 4.30 and 5 o'clock. It wasn't Monday through Friday, though, like most of us do. It was Sunday to Sunday. 4.30, you say, well, she must have gone to bed pretty early. Yeah, my mom and dad usually rolled to bed about 11.25 because they didn't watch the sports edition on the late night news, so they got up and, and walked to bed then. That was her day every day. She did that job every day of my life with such consistency, with such fervor, with such um, never change. You could set your clock according to what time dinner was going to be on the table, what we were doing, how things were going to be. She was that kind of person. And I, I, once again, I think she's a great mom, but I also thought about this. My mom was great because she put up with a lot of great things. My mom contracted lupus when I was born. It nearly killed her many times. It definitely altered her life. Kept her from doing things with us, too, because she was restricted. Lupus it was so, so bad in her case, she couldn't go out into the sun. A, a, just a simple outing in the sun would cause her to be violently sick, ill. Could even kill her, put her in the hospital for a time. My mom also battled cancer twice, the second time she lost. But through that time, when you, you watched my mom, most of the time you wouldn't have known. Sure, she had aches and pains, but she was stronger than anybody I've ever met. And that, in my mind, is this picture of this woman. But that really, once again, is not what Jesus was saying. In Matthew chapter 15, Jesus has been working so hard in ministry. He's been popular with the crowds. In fact, some of the greatest miracles that you can think of have happened just up to what we're talking about today. In fact, the one, miracle, one of the, the miracles that's recorded in all the gospel accounts is the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. That happens just before this. Jesus is overwhelmed with people. They just keep following him, wanting more healing done, more feedings, more, 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 more. Because that's our nature. We talked about that in the series earlier this year. We just want more. Newer, better, got to have more, got to have more. That's our nature. We consume, consume. And Jesus, <laughs> he's 100% man and 100% God, and he knew better. He wanted some time away. In fact, you remember after he feeds the 5,000, he sets the disciples in a boat, and he goes up and prays by himself that night, and then he comes and joins his disciples by walking on the water, and you have the famous Peter's attempt on walking on the water and all that going on. And then they end up in Gennesaret, and he's there doing some miracles. They bring some sick for him to heal there, and he's you know, feeling kind of overwhelmed. And when he tells them that he's the Messiah, they're all like, no, you're not. Get out of here. We don't want you. And so they wanted him for the healings, but they didn't want him for the truth. And so finally we find in, Hebrew, in Matthew chapter 15, Matthew writes in verse number 21, leaving that place, and we're talking about that place, Gennesaret, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now, that may not mean a whole lot to you, but Tyre and Sidon were not Jewish communities. Now, we, we can ask the question, why was Jesus going to Tyre and Sidon? In fact, what, what's all about Tyre and Sidon? I could spend hours telling you all details and stuff. Here's the bottom line. 
Jesus, and, and a lot of people speculate on this, but Jesus wanted some time to train his disciples because that was his mission, and he wanted some time to rejuvenate his ministry. He, he was being hunted by Herod, the same guy that beheaded John the Baptist. He, he, he was, Herod was interested in like, what's this, this guy Jesus all about? Is he, really, he thought he was John the Baptist come back to life. He was like having nightmares every night. And so, you know, Jesus wasn't really wanting to get trapped by Herod. The Pharisees, Sadducees, and all the religious guys, they were hating on him because he was stealing their popularity and their crowds were starting to dwindle. He was challenging their authority. And so they were plotting things all the time, trying to trap him. And if they could, they would have liked to found an excuse to kill him. But they hadn't really gotten a good one yet. And the crowds were just always wanting stuff without the truth. They wanted, hey, Jesus, can you make me better? Can you make me this? Can you give me this? Can you do feed, feed, feed? I want more, more, more. And that just drains you in ministry. And once again, in case you didn't know this, Jesus didn't come to perform miracles. Miracles, according to what Jesus said, were things he used as signs to prove that he was God. But that's not what he came to do. He came to seek and to save the lost. And so Jesus says, hey, you know what? The best place to go is a place that has nobody looking for me, or so we thought. And so he goes to Tyre and Sidon. Now, Tyre and Sidon are on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, more or less Lebanon today. And they are places that at that time period were not really inhabited by Jewish, a Jewish community. In fact, they would be considered Gentile cities. They were very pagan in their thinking. And when I say the word pagan, as opposed to people who were Jewish or Judaistic, they didn't practice the worship of Jehovah. So basically, Jesus is going not to escape peril. He's going to rejuvenate, to rest, relax, which is a side lesson we all should realize. Sooner or later, if you don't come apart, you will come apart. That's what Jesus would teach you. But even there, Jesus is found, because in the next verse, we find a Canaanite woman, and that's important. That's our main character. This is our zero. I'm going to be really honest who, who we're talking about today. This is our zero who becomes a hero. So it's a Canaanite woman. Now, that right away, like, I don't know if I know what a Canaanite woman is, you might be saying. I'm glad you asked. Let's just give you a simple thing. The Canaanites were people who were part of the Ike clans, and they inhabited all of the promised land that was given to Abraham and his descendants, the people of Israel. And they were given a chance way back when Abraham was around to turn to God. But over the years and years and years, they never changed their whole position. They kept jumping towards other things. They worship rocks, trees, sun, moon, stars, you name it. They worship the weather. In fact, they had a pantheon, which is just a fancy word for saying they had a lot of them. They had a pantheon of gods, among which were you have gods like Baal. If you didn't know, Baal's mentioned all the time through the Bible. Baal was that famous god. He actually was the weather god. In case you ever read the story of Elijah, when Elijah comes to this guy named Ahab and says, it's not going to rain, that was a direct attack on Baal, because Baal's the weather god. And so they wanted a weather god, so they have good weather, so they could go to the beach when they wanted to, and grow their crops when they wanted to, and so it was important to them. So they worshiped this guy named Baal. They had, uh, they had the god of, of fertility, Asherah. They had the Philistine god of Dagon, uh, which had a fish head, and he was real weird looking. Um, all these different gods... And that was their traditional gods. And on top of that, now that Rome is in charge, Rome has Zeus and all the, the Olympic gods, and then you, you, you turn over Greece and ruled, so there's the Greek gods too. And so you've got gods everywhere. And basically, a Canaanite was a person who did not believe in the one true God, the, the God that the Bible teaches about. They believed in all kinds of other gods. So here's our woman. She's our zero, and she's not a zero because she worships other gods. We could argue that, but I'm not going to claim that for her. She's a zero for other reasons, because it goes on to say, a Canaanite woman from that vicinity, so she's local, came to him, who? Jesus, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. <laughs> That's the problem, isn't it? Now, I remember at times... At least one of our kids, my wife, looking at me saying, I think he's demon-possessed. That's not what this passage is really saying here, okay? My son was not really demon-possessed. He just acted poorly. Um, that's the truth, okay? You may be thinking, like, yeah, I got one of those. That's not what she's saying here. She's not like, my daughter is so bad, she doesn't know how to behave in public. That's not what she's saying. 
She is literally saying she is suffering because of a problem. But what is interesting, and we sort of breezed over it, and I want to stop and point it out to you. When she says this, she comes to Jesus and says, Lord, that's a humility thing. Lord, son of David, that's recognizing his authority as the Messiah. Have mercy on my daughter, right? You guys reading it? What did it say? It didn't say that. Have mercy on my daughter because she's demon possessed. Is that what it said? It said, have mercy on, well, what kind of mom is she? Daughter's got a problem and she's asking for, is she saying, could you get rid of my daughter? Is that what she's saying? Not at all. Here's what, what, what we see in the first glimpse here. She understands the problem more clearly than most people do, and that's a great start for her, even though she's a zero. Her problem here is that she has this daughter who is suffering, and she is a mom, and moms have the biggest hearts on the planet, don't they? That's where all the guys should be like, amen, preacher. It'll get you some bonus points. Come on. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> But the truth of the matter is, here we are with this mom, her heart is broken, her heart is bleeding because she sees a suffering daughter. I don't know, you know what I love about my wife is my wife uh, is so compassionate about our kids even when I'm not. And that's sad for me, I know. You're going to think less of your preacher today, but I'm just being honest. My wife has spent nights crying for our kids and they don't even seem to care. Um, it, it, it bothers me, and I, then I get angry and want to take divine vengeance out. I'm the anger side of our relationship, um, in case you didn't know. Um, you probably guess that. Um, but this woman here is so distraught because of a real problem. I'm, I'm, I know we've joked a little bit, but it's a real problem. She's got a problem so devastating that she can't even go back to the practices of her own people. And if she's going to reject her own people that she lives with, what hope does she have? We have what I would call today a marginalized mom. You ever felt like that? Like, man, everything I do, nobody's happy with me. You don't even have to be a mom to be, feel marginalized. You can be a dad. You can be, a, you can be anybody here. I felt that way before, haven't you? And you just feel like nothing in my life can go right. Every decision I make is turning out wrong. Every time I turn to help, the the guidance around me, the culture around me, nothing is curing this. And you just cry out for mercy. I love that. She cries out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. And it's not a selfish request because what she's admitting to is something that is the first mark of this great mom. Because let me give you the bottom line before I get too far. What makes a great mom? A great faith. That's what Jesus is going to tell us. Now, that's the secret, and you don't have to, you know, if you want to write it down, I know it's not deep. I'm not trying to give you anything you're going to have to really concentrate on to memorize. But what makes a great mom, according to Jesus, is great faith? He's going to tell us this. So watch us out. But her first step in this journey of faith is the fact that she has to be real. She has to be real, and, and I love the fact that she has exhausted the sources of who she is. Matthew makes it clear she is not one of God's chosen. She's not part of the people of Israel. She's not someone who would necessarily turn to God. In fact, in our day and age, she, we consider like you're either some kind of crazy religion or you're a person who doesn't believe in God, period, at all. You're atheistic, you're agnostic, you're part of the society, and that's where she's turned to the answers, but what she's come up understanding here. And this is where God has helped her out. She understands that nothing she's done has helped relieve the problem. And faith is the issue. What am I trusting in? That's where she, she, she comes to. Because when you deal with this woman here and her problem, she says, Lord, I need mercy. And whenever you talk about a, someone who needs mercy, is you realize that this is someone who says, I need something that I can't and don't deserve. I can't have it. I don't deserve She's not asking for grace. Please give me more of something good that I I can't earn. She's saying, give me something I don't deserve. And basically, when she cries out for mercy, you know what this is an admission to? And this is why I think she's such a great mom. She's saying, you know what? The demon that's in my daughter, my fault. My fault. The suffering of my daughter, my fault. Reminds me of my mom. When it came down to things, my mom would give us stuff. In fact, I I learned that from my dad. My dad always talked. My dad went through the Depression era, and he talked about uh, his dad left him when he was young. He was a scoundrel and all that. 
So he loved his mom. He, his mom didn't have much. They struggled to, to put food on the table at the time. But he said he remembers when mom would cook beans, pot of beans, maybe make some cornbread for dinner, and that was it. And they really didn't have a full pot of beans. And mom would give hers to him. And we all know stories of people like that. That's really that act of selfless mercy. That's what, that's what this woman's doing for her daughter right now. She's saying, I'm going to put away everything I thought, and I've realized the key to my getting what I need is a step towards faith. And I think if we could just understand beyond the, the superficial churchy word faith that we throw around, um, faith is the actual target here. This is what we need to have. See, the first step in her trip to Jesus and becoming this great mom, this getting this great faith, is to recognize she has a great need, and the great need is repentance. Because that's really where faith starts. The beginning point of repentance, if you were like, hey, where do we start? Now, I, I'm going to stop you for just a second and tell you something that you know, but I want to point it out. The world throws around the word faith everywhere. Pop singers, country singers, you name it, they, they sing about it. They don't have a clue what they're talking about. Religious people throw it around all the time. Churches throw it around all the time. And faith is a problem because, as we've been talking about in our Sunday night Bible studies, we've been talking about the difference in faith. But faith, hey, faith is not just believing in God. Do you realize the demons believe in God? The Bible tells us that. That's not what faith is. She's got a problem here, and, and faith begins with realizing, what I'm doing ain't working. That's repentance. Faith is a change of mind that leads to a change of behavior, or really, I'd like to say it this way, a change of mind that leads to a change of heart. That's the definition as easy you can say about faith. She had to change her mind, and you're talking about somebody who's grown up worshiping false god after false god after false god, living in immorality. In fact, if you want to understand how bad the Canaanites were, you would have to go back to the book of Deuteronomy, and you would have to read what God had told them back then, that they were so, their, their society was so reprehensible that he wanted them wiped out, all of them. And that's where we all go, oh, God did that? God got to the place where he said the society of that day, the Canaanite society, was so anti-God, so, anti, uh, so destructive that he ordered their destruction by the Israelites. Of course, they didn't fulfill that, and that's why she's still here. But this is the problem. She's grown up in it, and that's her nature. And you know what? That's the problem with us, isn't it? So often we grow up, and we don't have the faith we, ha we should have because we've grown up in a culture even in a Christian culture sometimes. That's the truth. We sit back and we go, well, we're trusting tradition. We're trusting the process. We're trusting, hey, you know what? If it's not in here, we shouldn't be trusting it. That's just the truth. If it's not clearly from God, then we shouldn't be, you know, and, and that goes against everything. We, well, that's not the way we always did it. I know, but those are bad things to do. See, repentance says, I'm not doing it because it's not working. Because I, and this is a mom's view, I've got a child that's suffering, and I put her in that place. Because all those years of worshiping things that didn't have a, a great opportunity for me has caused problems. See, when you talk about faith, it begins with repentance, but the next thing you have to know about faith is faith requires an object, or it's not faith at all. Right? And the, that's the problem in weak Christianity today, we throw that word faith around, and faith has nothing to base it in. We have a world of Christians or a Christian society, people that claim to be Christians, who just believe that faith in faith is good enough. And faith in faith is, is just wishful thinking. And so we have a lot of Christians that are wishfully thinking, wishfully praying, not believing, not trusting. And she realizes all the wishes and dreams and hopes for her family, her daughter, are going out the tube because she's suffering. She's demon-possessed. She is doing things that, that are horrible now. And she's saying, please have mercy on me because I've made the mistakes being a mom. And isn't it great to know that other people make mistakes? Because I always felt, I, so often in my life, I, I, and I know Satan does this, he targets me and says, you made a mistake. You did it wrong. And he keeps shouting that in my ears. And I think he does that a lot of times to moms. Doesn't he? You're, some of you moms know what I'm talking. You don't have to answer me. I don't want, I'm not calling anybody out, but you know, you, you probably like, as a parent, even dads, like your kids didn't grow up the way you thought they would. They were less than maybe you hoped for. And you don't blame them. What you do is you start looking at yourself going, 
my fault, my fault. That's what she's doing here. She's saying, a demon for this daughter of mine, that's not her fault, it's my fault. I've made bad decisions. I was a bad parent. I wasn't the mom I need to be, and so I've got to start by changing who I am. Change of mind leading to a change of behavior, change of heart. That's repentance, and I've got to have the right focus. And so who's my right focus? When she looks over and says, there's that guy, Jesus, and I don't know if he really is, but I'm going to, I'm going to focus on him because there's, a, there's something that's worthy of my hope, worthy of my faith. And so many of us, we put hope in the wrong things. There's a world today that's putting hope in, in the, 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 the who, the World Health Organization. There's a hope that uh, today that's going out through politics. They're putting their hope in Democrats or Republicans. There's a hope that's going out in, in, in radical uh, terms of, of overturning regimes and governments. There's, there's hope for people putting into terrorist groups. You know that. That's what, when, when you see people that are going out and joining up to Al-Qaeda, Americans, by the way, are doing that. They're joining these terrorist groups and bombing us. What are they doing? They're searching for something to put their hope in. And this woman says, I've tried it all, and it hasn't fixed the situation. And if I want to be the great mom I need to be, if I'm going to save my family, save my kids, my first step is not her fixing her. You don't fix your family by fixing someone else. You fix your family by fixing you. And that's what she's saying here. Faith has to have an object, a trustworthy object. Because faith without an object is faith in faith, or it's just missing missing the point. It's wishful thinking. It's hoping in nothing. In verse 23, we find Jesus uh, to this, and this verse 23 is the most shocking verse that you're ever going to read to me. This is how Jesus answered. Verse 23, Jesus did not answer a word. Hmm. Hmm. Tough one there. <laughs> is, that what, is that the Jesus you follow? That's what people are going to ask you one day, Christian. This woman's got a demon possessed daughter who's suffering. She's begging. She's down on her hands and knees going, Please save my daughter. And what does Jesus do? Nothing. Jesus answered nothing. And it gets worse. Could it get worse? Yes, it does. So his disciples. You know those guys, 11 of them we revere, Peter, James, John, those guys. Now Judas, we know he was a bad guy, but his disciples came, and they're going to save the day, right? No. So his disciples came to him and urged him. This is, their, this is their good advice. This is the counsel of the godliest men of the Bible. Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. That should be the ministry terms, right? Hey, pray, hey preacher, let's set this as our ministry example. Just send them all away. They just want more stuff. They're fed up. They're tired. And they didn't see her as worthy. And this woman is now the biggest zero that we can ever find. She has no hope. She has no future. She has nothing to to, to look forward to. And these people, the Jesus that she thought she was coming to, didn't say a word. And the disciples that we revere, that other denominations canonized and made saints into, Peter, right? Right? Can we just send her away? She's a problem for us. And wouldn't it be nice to send away all your problems? It doesn't work, by the way. Verse 23 is that verse that we all have difficulty with. And this is where the atheist, the agnostic, and all the non-believers come to us and say, See? See? That Jesus, he's not a good guy. God doesn't help you. And then they start turning to you and say, where was God when your mom died? Where was God when when you got cancer? Where was God when your child died? Where was God when this bad thing happened? Where was God when you didn't get with this? And they go through all these things, and you're sitting there like, "Uh, uh, uh, uh," and we panic. Because just like this woman, we're shocked that Jesus didn't do anything. But there's a reason. See, what you have to realize when you get to this, Jesus ignores her for a reason. And the disciples did respond poorly, but look at verse 24, because the story's not over there. He answered. Now, he didn't answer her. He answered them. I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And you're like, what kind of answer is that? Jesus, you're not looking any better. Not helping out. This, you don't look like the Messiah, I thought. What about, hey, arms wide open and all that kind of stuff, and how you're going to let love flow and all that? You just told her, I didn't come for you. I'm not here to help you. Now, I today am not going to address the theological implications of the divine covenant of Israel and God. That's not, that would bore you to death. I promise you that. And some of you guys are like, I'm already bored. That's okay. 
What Jesus was trying to do, and this is what's so important, is Jesus wanted to take this woman and her little tiny seed of faith that she was starting to develop and make her into a great mom that had great faith. And the only way to do it is moving forward with Jesus. And that's something you should understand in your life. See, growing our faith is not easy. Growing our faith is not easy. We, you don't just come to church and go like, I'm going to listen to a pre- preacher sermon, and that's going to make my faith okay. It won't. It won't. You don't get it from that. You have to go through the hard times in your life and let God use things that are difficult to build your faith. And you know what? God doesn't work on your nine timing. Yours and your nine timing. God doesn't do that. God says, hey, you know what? I'll respond when I need to respond. And so he tells her, and by the way, he's being true to what he said. If you go back to Matthew chapter 10, and I didn't take time to do this. Matthew chapter 10, when Jesus sent out disciples to go out and do ministry, he told them not to go into any of the Gentile towns. He said, we're only here for the... And so there are some different things. But why would Jesus do that? Keep going in our story. Verse 25, here's the great thing. Because it's all about this woman and her development. Verse 25, the woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. <laughs> See, she's gotten the, the act of repentance. She's gotten the focus on the right object of faith. And so the next step has got to be persistence. In order to have that great faith, you've got to grow in your persistent approach to it. It's not easy believism. Hey, pray a prayer. That might work for you, but it's not long-term going to develop your faith. It's not just, hey, give me three things to believe and I'm done quote two verses and I'm okay. You don't just go and get wet in the water and then, hey, I'm perfect, fine as a, as a child of God. You've got to be persistent in your walk with God, and that's what determines a great mom with a great faith. And Jesus knew that, because if he just goes, okay, I'm healing her, we're fine, it's, it would be the happy, happily ever after story, but Jesus doesn't get involved in happily ever after stories like that. That's Hollywood that does that, right? That's fairy tales. That's Cinderella. This is real life. And maybe you've been to a point where things didn't come out. The prayer you prayed didn't get answered. And as I told the people last Sunday night, you know what? You may have faltered at God said, my God's not big enough to help me do anything. And this is what I would tell you. If God lets you suffer, your God is so big that he could. And that's even more impressive. It's an easy thing to get what you want. And as a good father, as a good parent, God doesn't just give us everything we want. That's just the truth. Because as the old country proverb says, give a boy and a pig everything they want, and you get a good pig and a bad boy. Think about that one. It's a good one. Not only was this woman now repentant, and her faith was in the right object, the only object that could help her, Jesus. And, and she had fallen down on her feet now to worship Jesus. So you see, things are growing in her. She was so persistent in her faith. And, and that's what I love about that. That persistency pays off. Uh, it, you know, it, and it's something that's tough. You go through the Bible, you got guys like Abraham, who's promised to be the father of a great multitude of nations, and, and he's, he doesn't get his promise fulfilled for... Well, he doesn't get his first child for 25 years, and it's 400 plus years before he sees the nation of Israel, and he's not around for that, by the way, um, become the nation of Israel. 400 plus. You got a guy like David. David, you know, Psalm 22, and I'm, I'm just going to read it real quick. Psalm 22, 2, David prays this prayer, and this is shocking because we know David's that man after God's own heart. David prays this prayer, my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. Ever felt that way? That's David felt that. He says, by night. He's saying, I cry out by night too, but I find no rest. You know what? David was anointed to be the next king of Israel at like his teen, in his teen, or late teenage years. You know, he was 30-something before he finally got a chance to sit on the throne. And once he finally gets on the throne, it was another seven and a half years before he got the complete kingdom of Israel. He was almost 40 before he really is the great king of Israel. You want to know why David cried that out? And we could go after it. Even in Jesus' own stories, you find a guy, uh, you know, Jairus comes and says, hey, my daughter needs to be healed. Come on, come on, come on. And what happens to her? She ends up dying. Now he, he raises her back, and so it works out. You got Lazarus. What does Jesus do? His best buddy, Lazarus. Lazarus, the guy I love so much. Yeah, I know he's sick, but uh, I want him to die. In fact, let's leave him in the ground for a couple days. 
That's how God works, and we don't like that, do we? Because we are so impatient. But to get that great faith, this woman had to be persistent in her faith. And what you find here in the English language, it does such a poor job um, helping us understand what she's doing. Other than if you go back to the verse where it talked about the disciples complaining about her, she keeps bothering us, send her away, right? That is a progressive tense verb. When she cries out, it wasn't a one-time cry out. She is following around Jesus and his group. This is why they complained about her. And she is continually falling down at his feet going, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. That's how much of a mother she wanted to be. I love my daughter so much. She's in so much torment that I will embarrass myself, that I will do what I have to to get the only person I know that can help to help. And it didn't seem like it was working, but she wasn't giving up. She was persistent. And I think in our own great faith lives, if we want to have great faith, we better start learning to be persistent to God. It's not a, hey, let's, you know, let's, let's pray one time. Let's be prayer warriors. Let's get down on our knees. Let's go out and pray that God would change people's lives. Let's pray for people for years that they get saved, not just one time. Let's be persistent in that faith. She was persistent and kept placing her faith in the right place in God. In verse 26, this is how it works out. Jesus replied, it is not right. That these answers are just so, so blow you away. It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dog. Once again, this has implications to Israel's covenant with God. In fact, it, 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 just to help you understand what, what he means here, Paul says it pretty clear that the gospel came first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. We're add-ons. And by the way, if you don't understand the term Gentile, I don't want to take it for granted, Gentiles is anybody who's not a Jew. The Jews were God's chosen special people, and we are not. And that's something we should always protect, because God has promised to bless them. That's an everlasting blessing. He'll bless those who bless them, curse those who curse them. So in our political stance, we are friends with Israel, or we should be. That's free for nothing there. Verse 27, verse 26, and this is what I love about it. Jesus tells her something that is so harsh. Uh, And by the way, he's not really calling her a dog. That word dog isn't like a scavenger dog. That actually is a nicer form in in the original language. It was a term for the family pet, so like a puppy dog. He's like, yeah, I didn't come to give food to the puppy dogs. I came to feed the the children. And and that's how he's saying it, And, and yet verse 27 This is what she says. Yes, it is, Lord. What? He just told you you're a dog, that you don't deserve it. And he's like, yeah. She's like, yeah, I agree with you. That's not something we see obvious. Can you see her faith developing here? It's growing. It's becoming great. And she says, yes, it is, Lord. Even the dogs eat crumbs that fall from their master's table. And, And what a great expression here. Because what we see here is this change. Because now she has added to all those different things we've talked about, she's added true humility. That is the aspect, the, 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 one of the final aspects of this great faith. Divine humility. It's humility that only God can give you. Because she doesn't get offended. See, most of us today, people do this all the time. They walk out of churches because the preacher said something they don't like. I don't agree with him. He stepped on my toes. If I said it, then you can argue with me. But if God said it, don't. That's what I would say. So who said it? Well, Jesus said it. Jesus said it here. You know what Jesus says? Hey, He says, hey, you know what? I didn't come to give scraps to the dogs, but I came to feed the children. I'm really coming to save Israel was my first primary because Israel's got a a job to do. And you know what? She says, I agree, but I just want to get a little bit of the fallout. I just want to be there to get the, I, I'm not worthy of it, and I'm not disagreeing with you. I just want the leftovers. I just want what the kids knock off the table. We're finding it difficult these days because we don't have a dog, and every time one of us drops something on the table, we look at each other and go, like, okay, we don't have a dog anymore. We're going to have to pick that one up. Um, that's been tough on us. It really has. We, we love our dog, miss our dog. Um, but uh, anyway, that's, she's using it, and, and I'm thinking in the desperate situation, she sort of, like, she accepts the truth. Most of us today... And this is why a lot of people walk away, especially the younger generation now. They walk away when they hear about judgment, about sin, about truth. If the preacher preaches on sin at most churches, hey, people get upset. Now, if I preach on somebody else's sin, it's okay. 
right? But if I preach on my sin, man, come on, preach, get off my toes. And the truth of the matter is she's saying, you know what, you're right. Jesus, you're right. I don't care. Point it out to me. I'm, I'm humble enough to accept the truth of God's word. All she was is desiring a crumb from God's mercy. Verse 28 finishes out. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Bingo. All that work, all that narrative, all that story to get her from being a zero to what Jesus just said is a hero. You don't become a hero, though, without Jesus. I don't know how to say that any other way. See, mankind's on this quest to be heroes. Superheroes, all kinds of heroes. We want to be political heroes, economic heroes. We want to be, uh, you know, social media heroes, all those kind of things. You know, none of those things are real. The only true hero that you can be is having great faith. That's what it is. Woman, you have great faith. And, by the way, your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. She went from zero to hero. So what is a great a mom? Great mom? What does it take? What makes a great mom? Okay, I could sit down and point out a lot of different attributes, but Jesus said, great mom, great faith. Which begs us to ask one question as we've been looking at the story. How about your faith? When I looked at the story, I felt convicted about my life. How often do I blame God, get short with God? He doesn't answer me in time. How often do I not humble myself? How often do I want what I want, when I want it, how I want it, and I don't care? How often? More often than I should. This woman, yeah, she was a zero. She became a hero. I wish to be a hero one day. Not like the world says, but a hero like Jesus would point out. A hero like the author of Hebrews would point out in Hebrews chapter 11. A hero that started as a zero. What a great mom. Let me have every head bowed and every eye closed. You know, we get down to it. The question comes down to faith, and that's that abstract term. Faith is believing in, in maybe something that you don't see, but it is real. I'm not asking you for a fairy tale faith. I'm not asking for a fantasy faith. I'm asking for a concrete, absolute structure in your life. I tell you this much, now that I've, I've got kids that are grown and I'm, I'm a grandfather now and all that, you know what, my greatest, greatest knowledge, I wish I knew now what, what, what I knew, I wish I knew then what I know now, but I, there are things I made important in my life that really weren't. And I wish I had been better at the faith thing. Yeah, I, I, I'm just being honest. I wish I had been better at the faith thing We get down to it, that's the only thing that's really going to matter. I remember years ago reading, uh, seeing the, the testimony about Pistol Pete Maravich, one of the greatest of all time basketball players, died early of heart problems. But on his deathbed, when he was interviewed in his deathbed, they asked him what life really was all about because he held, he held so many different awards and titles and things that may never get undone. But this is what he said was important. He said, the, the only thing that's important in life is who you love, who loves you, and what you did for Jesus. Who you love, who loves you, and what you did for Jesus. The only three things that matter. And I think, wow, that was great. I wish I could have said that. I think, though, when he said it, he was disappointed because if you don't know his story, he didn't know Jesus for a long time in his life. It was late in his life before he got saved. He lived his life for himself. So when he says those words, he was living regret. And as we, we hear on this Mother's Day, the greatest thing, mom, the greatest thing, dad, son, daughter, whoever you are today, the greatest thing you could ever know is that it's important to have that great faith. It starts with repentance. It starts with a change of heart. Change of mind that leads to change of heart. We want to help people on that road 
So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, your Savior, I'm not asking, are you a good person? Do you have good thoughts? Do you like people? I'm not asking all those things. I'm not asking, do you go to church? I'm not asking you if you're a church member. I'm not asking if you've ever been baptized, if you've given to church. I'm not asking those things because none of those things really matter. You know what matters? Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Has there ever been a time in your life where you made a commitment, a personal commitment, publicly expressed, by the way. I think that's important because the Bible does tell us that. It's not a private thing. It's a public thing. Paul said if you were to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. So have you done that? Because if you haven't, you're still a zero. You don't have a chance to be the hero yet. But we want to see you be a hero. We want to walk with you. So if you, you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, we beg you today. I'm here. I would love to take a conversation. There's, there's all kinds of people I can point you out. If you're not comfortable talking to me, if you're a lady, you want to talk to a lady, we, we can find somebody that can share with you how you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ died for you and he wants to redeem you because that's the most important thing we could ever do. The honest truth, if you don't know it, most of the people probably in this room have have already done that. But they came to a point in their life where they had to make a decision. You don't just get all of a sudden, I am one. You have to make a decision for God. That's the truth. So if you haven't made that decision, today's the day. For most of us, though, if you're here in this room and you're a Christian, you've come to church, what I've taught today, you're like, "Eh, I know, that's great, preacher. The question I have is, what kind of faith do you really have? What kind of faith do you really have? See, a lot of us, we have that showy faith, faith in faith, the fluffy faith that doesn't do anything. Our prayers aren't getting answered. We're not really having any kind of power with God because we don't have the power of God in us. So maybe you need to bow your heart today and repent. Maybe you need to make sure that the, 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 the focus of your faith is Jesus Christ and not something else, not a denomination, a church, a practice, a tradition, or anything else. Maybe you need to humble yourself. Maybe you need to to, to learn to bow down before God more often and make him bigger than you are. Maybe you just need to turn your heart and your life to God. God. Because God wants to give you that mercy. And and more than that, he wants to give you mercy and then give you grace, things that you don't deserve. And that's the greatness of our God. So when was the last time you asked yourself, how great is my faith? How much do I trust God? Do I trust him enough to help me? Or am I still trying to figure it out on my own? Do you want to be a hero or are you going to be a zero? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this time. We pray in this next moment of invitation that you would work in our hearts to stir our hearts and our minds to you. Thank you for the story of this woman who is so impactful in her being a mom. But it wasn't just that she was a mom. She was a great mom because she put her faith in you. And that was such a hard step because she had to turn away from everything she ever knew, turn to goodness, turn to truth, and listen to the harsh reality. It's not going to always be easy, the things we hear, but we need to hear from you because you're the one who designed us and created us to be more than the eternal life, that, uh, that, than the little life we're living today. So God, give us that life that begins today, that eternal life that starts today and moves forward and develops us into people of great faith, heroes, Because you're our story, not us. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. Verse of invitation. Do what God's Holy Spirit is talking to you right now as we sing. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was mine, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my
been having special visitors for a while now, um, and we've been waiting on it for a while. But um, we have two, two phenomenally special people in our church um, that are fairly new around us, um, and we are going to do some baby dedication today. So Zach and Kayla, you want to bring Little Bell up, and Ben and Holly, and I'm ringing again real bad, so um, bring Jaxie on up. Um, come on up to the platform, because I'm not coming down there, because it hurts a lot to do that. And people want to see you on camera too, so let me have. Um, just in way of, of saying this, and, and, and both these couples, they have fantastic, I love these, these active babies. Active, aren't, aren't we? Yeah. Um, and, and by the way, if you ever sit back and go, like, they just screamed during church. First of all, that embarrasses Ben, I know. It mortifies him. You know what I say? I love it. I love it. A church that's too quiet is a dead church. And we don't want that. We want life. So I love these kids playing. And, and just on behalf of these family, I want them to know on the platform right now, it doesn't bother me when they scream. Whatever they do, it's fun. Okay? And so uh, I might even stop and laugh at it. Um, biblically speaking, though, um, the, what we're doing today has deep foundations with God. This isn't just something that's tradition of churches to do. I want, I want to make clear on that. And it's something I feel very passionate about. Um, and, and I don't want to just do what what has been done in the past. Um, I'm not trying to, to, and I don't know what's been done in the past here, um, but I'm talking the past of my life. There, most of the time, baby dedications, you bring the baby up, and like they, the preacher rubs their head and says how cute they are, and then prays a prayer and says, sit down. Um, and they give them, give them a Bible and all that. That's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But I, I want to make sure that as a church, we have responsibilities. As parents, you guys have responsibilities. So we're going to be clear on that. And they, they might be like a little scared right now because they didn't know this. Um, but... <clears throat> God, in his writing of the Old Testament law, originally, and I said this back in our, in our Christmas series, in his old, writing of the Old Testament law, he originally took the children of Israel and told them that their firstborns would all be dedicated to, um, to God's work. Their firstborns were all going to be to given to God. In fact, he originally had all the male firstborns of the whole nation of Israel were going to be the priests. And then he, God came back and changed it that we know to the, the house of Aaron and all that. Um, but that's, that's where you start the foundation. You go a little further into the Bible and you see a guy named Jacob. And I, I love this. Jacob, on his deathbed, he's an old elderly man. Jacob has his 12 sons there and, and a couple of his grandsons. And he gives a blessing out to each one of them a specific blessing to each one of them. And it's so important, that blessing. And, and I know our society, we don't do it as much as they do, but man, it just really is amazing. You go into the book of 1 Samuel, and, and you see a woman named Hannah who hasn't had a child, and she's so desperate to have a child, and she comes and prays for a child, and finally God hears her and gives her the son Samuel, and she turns around and gives Samuel back to God, and he becomes one of the greatest um, prophet priests um, of, of, and judges of his time. Um, and, and just amazing what he did for the nation of Israel. And then you come all the way into the New Testament, and you find Mary and Joseph, and they're fulfilling the law of God, that original law that says firstborn sons should be dedicated to God. And so they are, after 40 days, she comes to declare her purity at the temple, and they bring Jesus in to give Jesus back to God as a priest. That's what they're doing there with, when Simeon and Anna... That's what they're doing there, and that gives God, Jesus, the right to be a priest in our lives, which is a good thing for us. And so I wanted to, see, I wanted to without preaching another sermon, I want to give that foundation. And what we want to do as a church is um, we have these, these Bibles that we want. They're, they're called Great and Small Bible, and they're keepsake Bibles for babies. Um, but um, on behalf of our church, I, I sat down, and um, there's one for each of them. 
that we want to give out. Um, on behalf of our church, I wanted to, to pronounce a blessing from our church to these, uh, to these young ladies. Um, because I don't know if there's ever a time that I feel more passionate about young people needing God's help to get through life than now. If we think it's bad when we grew up, can you imagine what they're going to go through? And so I have a heart for them. We need to pray for them. But uh, let me read it to you. This is the blessing that um, uh, I, I, I actually had my wife write it out because she's got better handwriting than I do. Um, but um, we put one in each one of the Bibles for them. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. May his word always be present in you and guide you in your life's journey. May God be great in and through you. Mabel Springs Baptist Church, Pastor Bill Simpson, baby dedication, May 9th, 2021. And so we have one that I'm going to give to, I'll give to Zach since, since uh, Kayla's got her hands full. That is for you. There's pages in there to fill out for your baby too, um, over things. And then the same thing for Miss Jaxie, I'll give it to Ben. And so, and, and I, I'll just be honest with you, what I, what I wanted, um, some of my first memories of my mom that were so formational. This is before I ever went to school. I mean, as early of memory as I can remember was my mom would take time um, when, she, when she could in the afternoons and bring me out to the living room, sit me down on the sofa, and she had this Bible story book, and she would sit me there, and she would read, read the stories of the Bible to me. And, and, and I loved it because there were some pictures and stuff like that. And I still remember my mom doing that. And that was such a, a formative bonding time, but it was also such a great influence on me. Um, and I think my, my mom and dad did it such a great job. You know, I've got two brothers that are preachers, too. Out of the four of us, two brothers that are preachers. Uh, and my sister is actually moving to South Carolina in the next week or so. Um, but uh, that, my parents had something going on that was right with God. And I, I always wanted to emulate whatever they could from them because they did good things. The other thing we have for them is, um, and we have one for each, here, let me have this one, because it's easier to turn the whole way, because this one's going to Zach and Kayla. Um, we, we had these made up for them. Audrey did this, by the way, uh, and that's not shameless advertising, it is, but um, <laughs> she does these kind of things, but um, no, I, I, I wanted, this, this is a day, this is a day where I want to just hand them a Bible and say, thanks for coming, go on. We want to seal this day, because this is a serious day for them. We are praying that God is going to touch these lives and use these young ladies in a great way. That's what we're doing here. And we're also committing, by the way, you as a church, this is what you're committing to. You're committing to supporting these families. And I'm not saying you don't already, but we want to go all out. They are new parents. You know, hey, um, they're, 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 uh, you know what I love about Ben and Holly have been so honest. They're like, yeah, we don't have a clue. Um, I love that. Because um, uh, sometimes, sometimes people are like, we got it all figured out. Um, same with Zach and Kayla. They're trying. To, uh, Kayla sat with my office a couple weeks ago, or I don't know, it was a couple. It's been a while, and just said, we just want to do the right thing. Uh, we we want to do the right thing. God help us if we can't get a nation of young people that would say that. And so, if they're going to do that, we as a church, we want to help them. So we had these these made up. They're they're terrific looking. It says our family, a circle of strength founded on faith joined in love. And that's really what we want. And on the back of each one, this one says, Jaxie's Baby Dedication Sunday, May 9th, 2021, Maple Springs Baptist Church, Seager, North Carolina. And so we want to present that too. So I guess, Ben, you get to hold this one too. And we have one for each of them. And, and what we're going to do, if you would stand with me, I know I'm going to have you stand and then we're going to have you sit down again, because Tracy's going to do the announcements and all that in just a minute. But I'm going to pray a prayer, and I'm actually going to, I'm actually going to, there's nothing special about my hands. Um, they are clean. Um, but there's nothing special about my hands, but I, I think there's power in this. Um, I'm going to place my hands on, I'm not going to place my hands on the children. I'm going to actually place my hands on the parents, because really, the baby dedication is more about the parents than it is the children. We're marking this day because we are commissioning them to be good parents, and we're going to hold them accountable. We don't want to see you making dumb mistakes. You'll make mistakes, but we're going to try and help you, not criticize you. We're not here to, to punch in the gut when you make a mistake. We're here to walk with you, just like that video said. So if you guys would come a little bit in front of me, because my arms only go so far, and I'm going to put my arms around you if it's okay. And if you guys would pray, aloud, uh, pray, pray in your hearts as I pray aloud and express our prayer, and then we're going to, um, we're going to thank God for what he's done and uh, turn it over to Tracy. God, we come before you today. We're just in awe of who you are. What a great God. To be able to bring life like these two young ladies. 
God, it's so exciting to see them in the beginning days where there's, they've got a blank slate. So God, we ask that your face always shines upon them. That your word is always a light into their path and a lamp into their feet. We ask that they're, they're always led by you and never led astray. But God, more than this, we ask for, first of all, for your church to be strengthened in its commitment to helping these young couples raise these, child, these children in, in godly nurture and admonition. We ask you that you would help us to be responsible enough not to be judgmental, not to be critical, not to be complaining, but to be encouraging, loving, and point them out to you. That we would follow all the one another verses that you've given us in the Bible and live those out. That we would love one another. That we would lift one another up. That we would bear one another's burdens. So God, we ask for that. God, we pray for these parents. The hardship of parenting is that we don't know what we're doing. And so God, I pray that you would help them in their greatest fears. Help them to, to learn to have the great faith that this woman had. And God, I pray that you would just give us an opportunity as we celebrate the lives of these children, as we go through birthdays and holidays and different, uh, uh, different moments with these children, that you would help them guide their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, that they would always blend truth with grace and grace with truth, and that they would always point you out to be the good God, the big God, the God that can do everything for them. So God, we thank you for all you do for us, through us, and in us and to us. We love you. We thank you for the gift of life today. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And God, Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, uh, thank you for coming and celebrating uh, not just the baby dedication, but also don't forget, it's Mother's Day. So if you haven't seen your mother, if you haven't talked to your mother, uh, make sure you take time to do that today. We're not having service tonight, so you do have that opportunity uh, to make sure if you if you were able to, uh, to reach out to your mom, do that. Uh, spend some time with her. Uh, spend some time in conversation with her. Uh, I encourage you to do that. As far as uh, announcements, I do have several announcements. Uh, the first one, uh, we kicked this off last week with the baby bottles. Uh, your choice is Randolph. Uh, we still have a couple more baby bottles back there if, if you didn't get one. One. And if you want one, please make sure you grab one. Uh, and also, didn't realize, but they also have a new app uh, through Your Choices Randolph. It's uh, it's uh, the Roundup app. You can go uh, uh, onto uh, your social media platform and, and download that and uh, be able to give online to that as well. And don't forget uh, those baby bottles. Uh, don't, don't just leave them laying. Uh, uh, forget about them. Uh, make sure you keep them in front of you. And uh, uh, make sure you fill those things up and get them back to us. And we're going to be doing this all the way through Father's Day. So uh, remember that. Uh, also, as far as uh, announcements, uh, ladies, uh, you have several different things going on. First of all, there is a table full of gifts back there for the ladies' ministry uh, for the Secret Sister. Please make sure you check that table out uh, uh, so you don't leave anything here that, that's supposed to be going home with you. Uh, also, uh, don't forget the paper products for the uh, um, uh, for the women's ministry uh, and that's taken up through the Randolph Baptist Association for the crisis uh, center, the women's crisis center uh, so make sure you keep uh, bringing that stuff in and then also this Wednesday here in the sanctuary at 6.30 is that right Miss Sandra? Uh, uh, women's ministry uh, will be meeting here at 6.30 uh, so make sure you remember that uh, also uh, don't forget the food pantry items uh, uh, we've been doing so good with that stuff uh, uh, more and more stuff is coming in keep that stuff coming in uh, uh, with, with everything that's going on it is much needed over there uh, with the amount of food that they're giving out so, so don't forget that uh, also uh, as we uh, uh, oh, uh, wood cutting. I uh, almost forgot that one. Wood cutting next Saturday. We're going to do that again, and that's going to be at uh, uh, my house again. Uh, we got a little bit more to do there to clean up, to unload, to load. Uh, and so we need some more back power on that. Uh, so if you're able to help out, that's next Saturday at 830 uh, at our house, the Marsh household. Uh, just come and... Uh, uh, we'll have some coffee. We'll have some other stuff out there, too, uh, just in case uh, 
uh, you were parched or something. Uh, so please make sure you come out for that. Also, as we enter a time uh, of prayer uh, and, and some of the prayer requests that we have coming up, uh, things that we need to pray for as we go through our coming week, uh, I encourage you, make sure that you use the Maple Springs uh, family page uh, and get those prayer requests in there uh, so we can get them, so we can make sure that we stay on top of those. Um, uh, I do ask that you continue to pray for... Uh, for Miss Sarah, uh, she's had one surgery, uh, and uh, she has another one coming up uh, uh, quicker than she probably wants it to come up, but uh, it's going to be coming. Also, remember uh, uh, Miss Ann, uh, and, and remember the entire family uh, as, as, as they uh, uh, walk through that. Continue to, that, what a great praise report, and continue to pray for that. Uh, uh, there, there's going to be more tests, there's going to be more stuff as they go through the years. Uh, so pray for them, and and I guess the final one, uh, as far as prayer, uh, pray for our mamas. Uh, I know it's Mother's Day, uh, the new mamas, the the mamas that are empty nesters. Uh, uh, it, what a special day for y'all, and I so I, I do want to make sure that I mention that uh, to pray for each one of y'all, and also uh, as far as the expected mothers, uh, don't forget there is a baby shower coming up for Miss Melissa. Uh, back there that is going to be at First Baptist uh, on Saturday May 22nd and that's uh, 3 to 5 it's kind of floaty because it's a drive through uh, baby shower uh, so so if you notice things are a little different when you're driving in just go with the flow uh, but uh, make sure you uh, uh, remember that as you go through the next couple weeks uh, with that said uh, as we finish up this morning we're going to finish off with uh, uh, our, 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 our worship as we give in our tithes and, and offerings and I do encourage you to make sure that you do that. Uh, you can give uh, without the baby bottles to the women's uh, uh, Your Choices Randolph. But we do ask that you, if you write a check, make sure you write that check to Your Choices Randolph. Uh, it makes things a lot easier. The homecoming is next week, of course, uh, but we're not doing the meal uh, and, and so forth. If you want any details on that, uh, 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 talk to Bill as you walk out. Uh, he can fill you in. Uh, yeah, it's going to be different because we're still uh, under uh, mandates and everything. Uh, and uh, we thought that with the food and everything, that just wouldn't work out, uh, especially the way that uh, the way that things are. Uh, so, uh, are we having homecoming? Yeah, we're still having homecoming. It's just going to it's going to look different. It's going to be different. Um, it is what it is. Uh, with that said, uh, uh, let's end in a word of prayer. Uh, and and also. Uh, like, like I was talking about, uh, make sure you make those checks payable uh, to your choices, Randolph, if you're giving that instead of giving to the bottle, and we'll make sure it gets to the right places. Uh, make sure you uh, drop in the offering, uh, uh, in the offering plate, uh, and don't forget to use Tithely if you get the opportunity to, to go online and do that. Uh, one of the best ways to give. Uh, uh, so with that said, uh, let's end in a word of prayer, and we'll dismiss as usual. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for today. Father, we do thank you for each and every day that you give us, Father. Uh, you are so good, uh, Father, uh, so good to us, uh, uh, and especially as we come together on Mother's Day. Father, I thank you for each and every mother that's in here today, Father. Uh, Father, we ask that you just uh, continue to have your hands on and around them, Father, especially to our newer mothers, dear Lord. Fathers, we've had the baby dedication this morning. Father, thank you so much for them. Uh, thank you so much for those families. And Father, we just ask that uh, you continue to be with us as we walk out today, as we celebrate with our offering and tithes, dear Lord. And remember that those, uh, as, we, as we give, Father, it's giving to you so your kingdom can go forward, Father. And again, Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you for everything that you do, everything that you have done, and most of all, everything that you're going to do in our futures. Uh, and again, Father, we thank you and we love you. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.